C'è chi il sabato sera cerca la festa che finisce. E c'è chi il sabato sera cerca la festa che non finisce. Noi cerchiamo quella che non finisce. E tu? Qui il centro di tutto è Gesù. Tutto il resto. Cattedrale, assemblee e predicatori sono solo signum et rimandum dell'unica verità. Oggi è la vigilia. Today is the vigil of Pentecost. That is 50 days after Easter, when the Holy Spirit descends down over the apostles. Therefore, on this evening, when many will be in, in the churches, uh, we too reunite on the base of a uh, phrase of Saint uh, John Cassiano, who says that to narrate the gestures of the Lord is to praise Him. We tonight will be talking about how to concretely work deeds of charity according to the Word of God, old and new. New Testament and according to the teachings of the church through the life of saints, that is in the different historical eras. And then with some uh, personal experiences with Fray Nathaniel and also um, uh, some of you uh, will share with us. And so we uh, begin by uh, reading the visitation of Mary to her cousin Elizabeth with one of you who will please read. And so we will uh, learn from here how to uh, actually do deeds of charity according to the word of God. During those days, Mary set out and traveled to the hill country in haste to a town of Judah, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeting Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the infant leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, cried out in a loud voice and said, Most blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how does it, this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For at the moment the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the infant leapt for joy. Blessed are you who believed that what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled. Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. So the uh, visitation of Mary to her cousin Elizabeth, uh, when we pray this meditation in the rosary, instead of uh, just praying uh, in the uh, second joyful mystery, we meditate uh, Mary visiting her cousin Elizabeth and then straight away saying, Our Father who art in heaven, how Mary, how Mary, how Mary. What we want to do is uh, stop and reflect on what we just said. Mary, why does she go and visit her cousin Elizabeth after she receives that uh, announcement in a mysterious way? So she understands and then goes and takes off to help her cousin on a human level just to help her knowing that she's pregnant at 80 years of age, at a human level, anthropological level. But um, at a human level, Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth who was in need. In cammino perché la cucina, l'umano può avere bisogno di aiuto, cioè l'anziana, la cucina che deve partorire e parte, quindi per fare la carità, e qua siamo una carità ancora che sembra umana, però Maria. But uh, Mary also understood that Elizabeth um, had uh, also conceived and there was the grace of God with her as well and so this wasn't just any uh, son that she was about to give birth to. Uh, Mary knew that Elizabeth was uh, going to give birth to someone who was going to announce the Saviour. So let's um, put this in relationship to us. So Mary, she, uh, she gets up and starts walking towards Elizabeth. So for us, this, um, this relative, uh, this cousin, could be symbolic of anyone who you know, we wish well, who we love, who we care for. So when uh, Mary gets up and goes, two very strong things happen to her. These two things that are also important for us in our contemporary time. Some people call it the postmodern time. 
at the time of reason or whatever people want to call it. And so she finds uh, her cousin with a belly which, um, you know, at 80 years of old and she was uh, sterile. So seeing something at a scientific level could uh, almost be impossible. Um, this isn't precisely what gives uh, Mary her faith because uh, Mary already believed um, through her faith in the scripture. But when she hears from her cousin Elizabeth the words, but for what reason does the mother of my Lord come to me? Mary sings the Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord. So Mary already had faith. But when she came to Elizabeth and saw the belly, of, that was like the stamp of the doctor on the receipt. And the signature was the voice of Elizabeth crying out, why does the mother of God come to me? So she realized, it confirmed that she was to be the mother of God. And so she finds all this confirmation in her own vocation. So why does this happen? It's in fact um, a gift from God that God confirms anyone who takes off and walks towards God's will in serving in charity. Mary did not ask for signs, and she received them. She received a certainty that will accompany her right up to the death of her son. And obviously also the resurrection. Above all, in that charity that I have to, for example, if I meet a friend or a neighbor, uh, not only in that my excess or something that I want to share with them, this is a human charity, but a charity which is aimed at waking up from within and caring for that uh, child spirit that has to go and announce the Savior and uh, the salvation that comes with him. And so also we will find many signs of benevolence that will, that will fully satisfy both our mind and our hearts. And we'll no longer be people who say that I just believe because of faith. That is a theological error. Or saying they only believe because they have reasoned over it. If this is taken to an extreme, also this is an error. So in Mary we see a model of a person who uses both faith and reason. And therefore St. John Paul II says that uh, faith and reason are the two wings of the Spirit. And so this uh, evangelical factor, we see a substantial difference from those who give charity just on a material level and who give charity of also uh, material and spiritual levels. So many times we hear people talking about uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so everyone, when uh, these uh, Africans come from overseas or these Muslims or from anyone from these third world countries, and so we help them, we give them some bread, we give them a bed. Sometimes we criticize the uh, political institutions. Without thinking that uh, more than just helping them on a material level, which is already a good thing, but we also need to help give them the truth. So John Paul II in a message for peace, if I'm not wrong, in 2002 said that little by little we need to know the culture of these people who are coming to us so that if a Muslim comes up to me, for example, I'd know how to evangelize him by using even the Quran to help him understand that it wasn't hunger that brought him here, but maybe through that suffering that it had been some kind of divine providence. A little like um, Jacob, who God said to him that I only give you two choices. One, go back to Egypt and buy some flour, or die. So to tell them that it's not their hunger that brought them here, but behind all of this suffering, there might be a great divine providence to help them find a greater faith, Christ. I, I always say that behind a great and painful suffering is hidden a great and divine providence, just like behind the cross is hidden the resurrection. So it's possible that the Lord permits all this suffering so that they may even give birth to a new life that may lead them towards eternal life. So therefore, the example of the Good Samaritan. The text says that uh, these people were descending from Jerusalem towards Jericho. I've actually been there. Dry and arid, ugly places they're heading down. He fell into the hands of some brigands and uh, got beaten. And so he was left half dead. And um, the text of St. Luke says that priests of that time, not of our priests, the priests of the Old Testament. Now, this could also symbolize the priests of our time, could also symbolize a friar or even you. 
it could be all of us, that he actually descended, saw the man that was left half dead, and keeps moving forward. But the test clearly says that he was descending. Then it says that also descending was a Levite. So also means that he was also descending. And he doesn't help either, he keeps going as well. So he was descending as well. The Good Samaritan, it says that he was on a voyage. He stops, helps this man that was taken by the brigands on a human level. So it's written that he's on a voyage, it says. So this is someone who helps, gives charity. It doesn't say that he goes up the hill, but it just says that he's on a voyage. And so someone who gives charity just on a human level, it's already guaranteed they're journeying, they're moving forward. The difference between the Good Samaritan who helps just at a human level and Mary who goes towards the cousin Elizabeth to also help above all on a spiritual level, it says that Mary went walking, she went walking in haste to the hill country upwards because Mary helped in a superior level, not only on a physical level, but above all, to carry Jesus to Elizabeth. So from this we can learn that not only like the Good Samaritan do we want to help on a material level, but in everything we do, every ride, every discussion, every encounter, our aim is to send people to Jesus, who is the only one that can help us out of the box of death. In Martha and Mary, if I'm not wrong, I think we see the same model. First one who jumps like a trampoline towards charity is, uh, is Martha, but she worries uh, about too many things. And Jesus uh, corrects her, Martha, Martha, you get agitated and worry about many things, but only one thing is worthwhile. With Fra Joseph, who studies at Rome, at the Biblical University, we saw we saw that in the Greek biblical text, also confirmed by uh, Father Rosario, who's now become uh, the bishop at uh, Piazza Marina. It's not written only one thing. In synthesis, what it's what it really means is there are a few things that are important in life. Come and sit down and listen. <laughs> listen how to get out of the box of death. Listen to how to find eternal life. Listen to how you can overcome suffering. So even looking at the experience of saints, there's not only the aspect of listening doesn't mean only one thing is necessary it means just a few things because if I only try to do what Mary did by listening even as a friar like myself and friar Michael we don't clean up the house if we don't sweep the floor for example I tell you, sooner or later the whole house is gonna start stinking like so in that house where there is Mary who listens and where there's Martha who serves, that is both aspects, not just one, but both, it's in that house where Lazarus resurrects. Where did Jesus resurrect Lazarus? It was in that house where there was both of those aspects. Uh, this actually happened to me once when I was in uh, uh, Sicily. I was in a, uh, a elevator with the rector of a seminary. We were going up and I was speaking with the rector. His name is uh, Father Massimo. And um, I said to him, well, wow, how beautiful is the a this aspect of Martha and Mary because where the two of them were at, the, these two aspects of both listening and service, is there where Lazarus uh, resurrects. And I said, wow, that's beautiful meditation yeah beautiful but all of this uh, does underline that the primary importance is in listening I'll give you a concrete example here we have a doctor there's also a nurse and let's just say even even better a better example let's just say there was a surgeon if the surgeon doesn't first do the part of Mary before doing Martha's part, if one doesn't study first to even know where the heart is, let's just say that someone has appendicitis, and then he goes and gets the scalpel and says, hey, well, where is the, where is the appendix? 
Well, you know, I'm not sure where it is, but I'm going to cut right here. Oh, look, it's this uh, red piece of meat. I'm just going to take that out. Instead of caring for this person with love, they kill them straight away, just like that. So in the same way, if we don't reflect before we speak, just as it's written in the book of Proverbs, who speaks without reflecting, stabs like a sword. We risk, rather than being doctors, ending up being butchers. So therefore, we need to know how to concretely actually be charitable. Have you ever heard, we have to love everybody, but above all, the greatest sinners? Have you ever heard this phrase before? I've heard it several times. Maybe only Nathaniel, well, already with four or five, look, yeah, okay. The phrase, more or less this phrase, you know. But it's not the truth. <laughs> this is why we pray to understand these things. St. Paul says, Brothers, given the opportunity, let us do good to all, but especially to the brothers in faith. So there's that explanation, above all to the brothers in faith. If I have to spend my time with someone who doesn't care less about the truth, I'll help him all the same, as the scripture says. If a friend needs help, yeah, and he's hungry, give him to eat. We're all distracted sometimes, we might even forget. But... I have to love everybody and have, uh, if I have the opportunity to help them, but my preference I have to give to those who are open to the truth, even to those people who don't realize that the objective truth corresponds with Jesus. I still have to do it, I have to help them, but to try to give them appropriately. So then, now we'll speak about a uh, normal charity, though um, Saint Mother Teresa of Calcutta will help us understand better. A lot of us may know the, the phrase that Cardinal Vallini said at Rome. He said, we greet each other with the number 25. I already understood what he was saying and I start, began to smile. But then he explained himself afterwards. He was explaining Matthew 25 from verses 31 to 40. Or, God forbid us, from 41 onwards, which is pretty ugly. It's the biblical passage of when Jesus speaks about the final judgment. And when the Son of Man will come, he will put all the, the sheep to his right and all of uh, the, the goats to his, to his left. Have you ever noticed that the face of a goat uh, is similar to the little face of a, a nasty little devil? And the, the character of a goat is hard-headed, disobedient. Whereas the sheep on his right says, Come, blessed by my father. I was hungry, you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. I was stranger, you gave me a place to stay. You know, I was sick and you visited me etc. So he says, come blessed by my father. More or less, this is uh, the scriptural passage. And so for those on the left, it says, go far from me to the place um, prepared for the devil and his angels. And then says the motivation, I was hungry and you didn't give me to eat. I was thirsty and you didn't give me to drink, etc, etc. Now, before, when I used to speak of poverty, now, before I was a friar, when I had money, now I don't have money, and I don't want money, not even a lira. So, thanks be to St. Francis, uh, and his example, and the example of Jesus, obviously. I've, um, I undressed myself from all of this wealth, I gave all my, my wealth to the poor. And uh, then I went to Naples, to Lourdes and to Fatima without one cent, just to experience what it was like to be poor. People would spit on me as if I was like trash. And Naples, they even, uh, they stole uh, uh, what I had begged for. I started to laugh and said, you know, Lord forgive them, they do not know what they're doing. So the people treated me really badly, like even looking at me, you know, as if I was like a turd on the side of the road. They didn't know what I was trying to do, nor did, nor did they even try to ask me. So for whatever reason you find poor people on the side of the road, either because they don't want to work, or maybe, you know, they've, um, they've been fired, or because of some kind of situation at work, maybe the, his wife kicked him out. Before thinking something bad about these guys, have we ever tried to even like ask them, 
So, you know, what, what happened to them? And then there was this uh, other Na- Napolitan, a really good one, you know, because, you know, of course, there are really good people also in, in Naples. He came down and looked at me. And so he said in a Napolitan accent, uh, Oi, uh, my son, a young man, uh, you, uh, you beautiful man, uh, young man, uh, son of a mother, I uh, help you, you want a, caf- a cappuccino, I get you a cappuccino. And so this guy, he really, really, with all his heart, with so much love, helped me. So at that moment I realized that when I have to deal with poor people, I know how I have to behave. That I have to try and help these guys, you know, with a gesture of love. Because I experienced what it's like to be a poor, well then I can understand what it's like to be poor. So just to prove to some poor people that I don't have any money, sometimes I have to carry a wallet with me just so they can open up in front of them and show them that I had no money in here. You know, you, know, you can even stick your hands in my pockets and you'll see i got nothing. But a good word, I will always give you. In Rome, what we do is we carry a lot of candies, mint candies in our pockets because there's so many poor people people there, that at least I can give them something. There's so many poor there, maybe here we don't see as many, but you know, if the people see a friar walk past a poor man and not stop and give him something, it leaves bad witness. So what we'll do is, we'll, for every poor man that's there, we'll stop, we'll give them a candy, a good word. Candy, a good word. Candy, and a good word, always. So the material charity always united with the spiritual charity. Pope Benedict XVI, Ratzinger, said that who does not give God gives way too little, or one could say almost nothing. Mary, who goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth. Now, an even greater and more important example, not chronologically, but uh, with Christ, Jesus, who goes to visit Jerusalem, and walking past, he looks down, and referring not only to the Jews, but anyone who doesn't want to accept the truth itself. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you have not recognized the time in which you were visited. So, we can understand that we can do all the charity we want, but if we're not ready to listen, if we're not ready to listen attentively to how the Lord wants us to give charity, then our charity, there will not be remaining one stone left upon another. That is, everything that we've tried to build, we'll lose all of it if we haven't built on God's will. But why does Jesus say this? If one wants to, they could even see a connection with Genesis 18. When Abraham meets the three men that he says, my Lord, at the Oaks of Mamre, what happens when Abraham welcomes these three men? There's a little dialogue, that is the word of God is coming to him through the Holy Trinity, because in fact he calls these three people singularly, my Lord, and one year later there is the blessed fruit of his son that God had promised him through his wife who was sterile. One well, could say if one's life feels sterile, it might be because they're not in connection with God. Uh, yesterday the bishop was saying at uh, Davila, and he was saying how we got all these problems with uh, politics. It's not the politics that have the problem. It's because people think that religion is something which is secondary. <laughs> that, that maybe a religion is an optional. Well, all of the problems that happen is because we don't listen to God. Therefore, all of our work is sterile without God on a work level, on a human level, on a friendship level, on a level of uh, family or even community, on a level of church uh, with the bishop and priests and even amongst other churches. The sterility can happen because of the fact that we don't listen to that spirit, the spirit of Jesus, as we're distracted. So if we listen like Abraham, we will be fruitful and the things that we do will be fixed like the stars in heaven they're not going to fall they'll stay but rather Jerusalem which doesn't indicate only the Jews but in particular those who just don't want to listen to the truth all of these people have been building but nothing will be left stone over stone and that is a total failure for he who doesn't build on God a uh, practical example. One day I was uh, at Palermo. I went to visit a friend of mine who happened to have an issue with his heart. 
And uh, one could say that he had a, a miracle, a sign of benevolence, a, um, a biological coincidence, or whatever you want to call it. And so whilst I was there trying to visit him, he was there all content because so many people had uh, prayed for him. His, uh, his daughter even made a promise that she would give her life to God if, if he was healed. And so whilst there, there was also um, a friend of his that said, I... I don't need the church. If I'm going to do good on my own, I go to Africa. I have no need to say that my good is connected with God. I do my good on my own. And so I said to him, well, you could sell your house, all your possessions. With all that money, you could go to Africa and you could, you know, save the life of all these Africans and all these children. But you resolve their problems materially for maybe at the most a hundred years. But after that 100 years or so, when all those, those children have died, um, all this good of yours, <laughs> once they're dead, like you haven't solved anything at all without God. Now, if I as a believer sold my house, and I don't have a house, you know, like you know, I already sold everything I had, and then went to Africa, and I gave them materially, but above all, I gave them God. I helped them understand God's will. And they come to believe in Christ. And so having the certainty of God, he then finds not the hope, but the certainty of the possibility of one day, if he perseveres in the holy perseverance, resurrecting. And so his problem of hunger has been resolved once and for all. Blessed are the hungry also of justice, because they will be filled. Where is the, the greatest hunger? The, the sacred scripture says, they will have hunger for the word which we carry here. The word of God. That's what people are hungry for today. And so this is what we have to give to them. Now I'll give you the example of uh, the massacre at Rwanda. One day when we were at the seminary of uh, Kasensa, a missionary came from Rwanda, spoke to one of our brothers who was having a, a long experience with us. And he said that uh, these missionaries had gone to Rwanda and uh, given them to eat. They gave them food, they gave them more food and even more food. And so, worrying a little bit too much about their material needs, they neglected the ministry of the Word of God. So, what was the conclusion with all of this? It was that when there were differences, um, conflicts between the different ethnic backgrounds of these people, they massacred each other with machetes and axes. Terrible. Because in the end, the missionaries forgot to teach them to turn the other cheek. If you kill other people, you don't resolve anything in your life. Who kills by the sword dies by the sword. The word of God, you can't escape it. So though, if someone repents though, the grace of God will return back to them like a boomerang. And so we wanted to go to Albania, like so that we knew to give to the, 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 the poor this money. And you know, even then, back then, the bishop was uh, the bishop of Nodo. Um, at the time, Malandrino was against that because they thought we were dangerous because we got rid of, we sold all our houses and gave it to the poor. But we called to this perfection. At least in our community, we were looking at trying to live this at 100%. Uh, this is what we're called to. So anyhow, we went to Albania. And we went with this mission group and we took... Um, there was like a whole group taking money over to help the poor people there. And, and they told us, whatever you do, when you get there, don't speak of Jesus. Mamma mia, I almost exploded. Like, you know, like I was hot before I was a friar and I'm hot now that I'm a friar. I went red in my face. And I said, well, if that's the case, we'll take our money elsewhere. If you go to tell me, okay, be prudent, uh, be delicate. Okay. That's uh, the, the church's mentality. You want to be um, sweet and with prudence, re respect, etc. Okay. Paul VI says that in Ecclesiam Suum. So we went there and we talked about Jesus. This is like to betray our calling, you know, like what, what are we going to do? Go there and not speak about Jesus? We even have a sister from Albania. Where is she? There she is. Yeah, you imagine if we came to, to uh, Albania, when you were Muslim, for example. Yeah, so you see here we have a, a Muslim, an ex-Muslim, who converted 
to the Christian Catholic faith and she'll also give a little bit of her uh, experience so if there's anyone here that wants to go to Africa and know there are some who are preparing to go that you know you can already prepare with the, these catechesis what you want to say to the people how are you going to say it to them you know always with being delicate but um, to carry your spiritual contribution as well like the word of God so now we'll have a moment of pause and I'll uh, conclude with uh, this passage. So uh, Acts 6 uh, verses 2 to 4 where it says, uh, It is not right for us to neglect the word of God to serve at table. The day that the bishop, on a spiritual level, uh, entrusted to me the, uh, the soup kitchen, the diocesan soup kitchen, there was this scriptural passage that it's not right that we should neglect the Word of God to serve the table. And I told the bishop and he said, yes, yes, that's your job. You have to serve the spiritual food because that's what your charism is, to carry the word of God to people you know, because you don't have anything yourself. And so that place must become a place of evangelization. And thanks to the charity of many people, I can even share what we have in excess because the Lord never leaves us without anything. You know, we always have an abundance of things. And, and so there's a friendship that has been born a bit amongst us and the poor, but the, the friendship has got an aim to it. You know, there was a young man that didn't care the least bit about God or the church. And uh, and he started speaking badly about the bishop. And I told him, oh, well, you know, the bishop is the one that wanted this soup kitchen. You're eating here. Thanks be to the bishop. And so anyhow, this guy made a friendship with us because we went to his house and became friends with him. And so anyhow, he introduces us to his dad. And like, oh, this fry is not like the other ones. He's like, this guy's, you know, this is... So, that, you know, the friendship grows. And so, uh, this guy wants me to fall in love with the beauty that's in the church, with the truth that's in the church, where there is found the fullness of the means of salvation. What we just said, um, not doesn't come from me, but Jesus says, my words are spirit and life. And so this spirit is a spirit of life as we put it into practice. And as uh, Psalm 118 says, uh, in parenthesis, your words, O Lord, are light for my path and lamp for my steps. Okay, so getting back to the heart of the issue, um, according to the Word of God, what is charity? What is love? So many could think uh, that the that love, oh, love, oh, how much I love you in the Lord. Yes, also this. But it's not only this. And now I have to say a complicated word, explicatio terminorum, that is the explanation of the terminology, which is found in St. John the Apostle. In this consists the love of God, hyphen, in observing his commandments. If you love me, says the Lord, observe my commandments not only of the Old Testament, but above all, the commandments of love. Love one another. In fact, he doesn't say love your neighbor as in the Old Testament, but he says in a plural form, love one another as I have loved you. So it's not only love one another, but he continues, love one another as I have loved you. This is the important thing. And how did Jesus love us? There is no greater love than this than to give one's life for their own friends. If you permit me, I'd like to give an applause to uh, Father Robert um, and for all the priests here, the, the nuns, uh, not only the ones in this room, but the Africans, the ones in Africa, all over the world, the friars, all over the world, these people have given all of their life to God, beginning with Jesus. That's really necessary. But not everyone can give their lives a hundred percent as such so people don't get discouraged he also says he who gives 30 he who gives 60 or he who gives a hundred percent so how is this 30 60 or 100 percent to be performed like what does it actually mean by giving your life there are many different ways what's important is that one puts themselves in prayer 
and uh, one through the scripture uh, can find diff many different examples. Uh, someone once uh, argued that uh, against one of my meditations that when Jesus says to Peter, do you love me more than the others? Why does Jesus say these words than the others? Uh, other than... Examples. Uh, argued that uh, about when Jesus says to Peter more than the others why does Jesus say these words do you argued that agape no papel Jesus says to Peter, do you love uh, argued Perché fa questa domanda? Mi ha... Perché fa questa domanda? Mi Tu di costoro?
Yes, I was Muslim. But um, over a series of uh, incidents, uh, I received in a certain way an announcement um, to get closer to the Catholic Church. And uh, I also then later got baptized. My brothers were already baptized, but my parents still to this day are not baptized. And so one day I went home and told them, hey, you know, I want to receive uh, baptism to begin uh, the catechumenate. And they told me, no, this you cannot do. And so in their anger, one of uh, my family members took a knife and put it up to my side right here and said, I'm going to kill you. And so I said to him, okay, well, you know, this is me. I'm here more than killing me. What can you do? And so later when uh, I joined uh, this community and started doing my internal formation, I read in the book of Revelation that in chapter 10, verse 2, it says, be faithful until death and you will receive the crown of life. And I said, well, <laughs> I were, in a certain way, lived this scriptural passage. You know, I hope one day that God will give me that uh, crown of glory. <laughs>